Wow. We'll try it again. Good evening. Good evening. We're getting there. I want to welcome everyone to worship tonight. As always, it is good to be here. Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. We're just going to dive right into some worship. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house and to worship you. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to serve our community with the dinner tonight, Lord. But Lord, we are so grateful that we live in a nation that we are free to, to gather and to assemble and to worship and to lift up the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that tonight that everything we think, everything we say, everything, everything that we sing or play or the technology, Lord, this whole thing, Lord, is designed to bring glory and honor to you. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our opening song. Let's stand and sing. Amen. Let's take this opportunity to shake some hands and greet one another as we pass the peace.
right, let's continue to stand as we worship the Lord in song. Let's stand and sing. to worship this evening. Let's collect our evening tithes and offerings.
Let's pray. Father, God, we love you. And Lord, we're, we're here for the simple reason because, God, we want to encounter you in our lives. And God, we want you to, to just be such, an, such the driving force behind our life, God, that every chance we have to gather and to worship you and to lift up the name of Jesus, God, that's where we want to be because, God, we are so in love with you. And Lord, we are so thankful right now, God, for the work you're already doing in our hearts tonight as we've just worshiped this evening, God, that you've already begun to, to transform our lives because that's what you do, Father. God, you always work at bringing us into a close relationship with you. And the word says, draw near to you and you'll draw near to us. And God, we're here to meet with you tonight. Father, I do pray for these offerings and gifts that, God, you would use them to reach this community with the message of Jesus Christ. That, Father God, it'll be used to fund ministries that are going to make you famous in this place. God, I pray that tonight as we look at the word, that, Holy Spirit, you would just open our ears and our hearts to hear tonight. God, that you would use me as your instrument, Lord. Let me just take myself out of this equation, God. I'm just here to, to do what you ask of me and to be obedient to you tonight, Father. Lord, we pray all this in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right, go ahead and have a seat, guys. Let's start out with a couple of questions. What do you think of when you hear the word obedience? Anyone got an answer? What's that? Everyone's like, Steve, you're here to talk. We're here to listen. I love it. <laughs> All right, so no one knows what obedience is. Cool. That makes my job a little easier tonight. I don't have to on-train stuff. But more, most of the time when I ask someone what they think of obedience, they give me answers like this. It means following the rules and guidelines, being obedient to that, right? I got to listen, doing, doing what you're told, doing what's expected of you, things like that, okay? Um, if I talk to young people, they're going to say, you know, I'm supposed to do what mom and dad tell me to do. And then I say, well, do you? And they say, I'm supposed to do <laughs> what mom and dad tell me to do. And... and and all those things are true. Like that's, that's part of obedience is, to, is to, to do what is expected of you, to listen, to follow the rules. But now let me ask this question. What's our motivation for being obedient? You know, if I, I talk to a student in school, their motivation for being obedient is they want to get good grades, right? Can't get good grades if I'm getting kicked out of school and that kind of stuff. Um, amazing how many people in America I say, What's your motivation at work? Like, what, what, what drives you at work? Well, I just want to do to make sure I don't get fired. Which is basically what we're saying in all these situations is we're doing just enough to not get ourselves in trouble. And that's, that's part of obedience. But what happens if we as Christians took the word obedience and we, we made it like this? Our obedience comes from complete love and reverence of God. Meaning I do what I'm supposed to do at work, not because I don't want to get fired, because I want to glorify God with my life at work. What happens if, if teenagers, if we attacked school with that mentality of, I'm going to work my, my rear end off at school so that I, I get good grades to glorify God with my life. Like, there's a big difference between trying to get by and, and not get in trouble and glorifying God with our lives. And this is the, the, the motivation behind um, obedience we're going, to, we're going to look at some scripture tonight. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 22. If you want to follow along uh, in your Bible or up on the screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Lord saw how great the, wick, how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inkling of, of the thoughts of the human's heart was only evil at the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe... I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move them along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for this earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both 
uh, both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark out of cypress wood, and make room in it for and coat and make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build the ark. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof make a roof over it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all the way around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the, into the ark two of, two of all living creatures, male and female, and to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come with you to, you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored and stored away as food for them and food for you. Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. All right, this, this is probably one of the most overtold Bible stories in all the Bible, but there's so much stuff in here that tends to be missed. So let's kind of break this down. The first thing we notice is, is, is God sees how wicked man has become. Okay? This is, this is key. States that everything in our hearts is, is done with the intention or the motivation of evil. This is what God sees in human beings at this time. It goes on to say that if you read the, the old NIV, probably the Pew Bible, it's not the one on the screen, it says that God says his heart was grieved and his heart was filled with pain. Think about this. So, so put this in perspective for a second. That I hear people say all the time, God does not have emotions. But then I read here that says his heart was filled with pain. Okay, so we need to understand that we, we've kind of we've kind of taken some of this stuff out of context a little bit and said, you know what, nothing bothers God, not true. If nothing bothered God, sin wouldn't be an issue, right? Adam and Eve would, would never have been kicked out of the garden. We wouldn't see the flood happen. So we need to understand that, yes, our behaviors, our things does grieve God and can and does put pain in his heart. So God has this plan. He's going to wipe out everything he created because he's so disappointed, he's so grieved of all the stuff he's made and how they, how they've turned. So you see this, you see this, this passion of God saying, everything I had desired, everything I built for is all messed up, and I should have never done it. But then, out of nowhere, kind of, kind of almost out of nowhere in this passage, you just hear this, this passage about how much pain and grief God has, and then he says, but, he found, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It says Noah was a righteous man. And I love how Faith Weaver describes um, a righteousness is those who worship and obey God. Okay, so worshiping God and obeying God, they go together to make a righteous person. In verse 11, it says the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God tells Noah his plan to get rid of all this violence. Okay, God says, look, I've had it, I'm done. He's confiding in Noah, which is kind of cool to think about like out of all this stuff and all this pain god has he's having this conversation one-on-one with noah he tells him to build an ark and and to break it down it's 450 feet long okay that is one and a half football fields that's huge right 75 feet wide that is as long as a high school basketball court so if you go to magic city look at their basketball court or go to any other school high school and look at their regulation court, that's how wide it is. So one and a half football fields long, basketball court wide, five story, 45 feet high, which is about five stories, which is basically the equivalent to the big M building downtown, the Minot building. That's, think about the size of this task God's put no on. All right, and I've read the Bible, there's no power sauce. So he's got a lot of work to do. Very specific, he says doors on the side, three decks, build a roof. Uh, you know, covered 18 inches up, all that kind of stuff. And God says, do this, I'm going, to, I'm going to destroy everything except for you and your family. Bring with you two of every living creature and, and keep them alive. So it wasn't enough that Noah had to build this giant boat. But then God says, once the floodwaters come, which by the way, if you've studied Noah, you know that it never rained on earth until the flood. All the other water came up from the ground, springs, oceans, lakes, things like that. So 
God gives Noah this enormous task of building this boat and then says, and once you get on the boat, you're just really getting started because now you have to keep all these animals and yourself and your family alive as I destroy the earth. And the, the key to this is at the very end, it says Noah did everything just as God had commanded. Okay, that's, that's the point is God calls us to do something. We don't have the privilege of doing it the way we want to, right? Obedience is, God, you're asking me to do something that makes absolutely no sense. You're telling me to build this giant boat because you're going to flood the earth and then you're going to have this thing called rain that no one's ever heard of before. People got to think Noah's crazy, right? But it says he, was, he did everything just as God commanded. So what does that mean for our lives today? First thing is, we can grieve God with our disobedience. Okay, and this is, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the human race could grieve God um, and, and cause this flood, God is still the same God, right? He still has that. We can still grieve him. Um, so if sin and, and uh, disobedience can grieve God in Noah's day, it has to, has to grieve God today. We must, un must then understand that our, our actions today are also, um, God can feel those, right? God sees he's walking with each one of us. This happens because God loves us so much that when we walk in sin, specifically knowing sin, specifically things that we know are sins, it hurts God. It hurts, it grieves him, it pains him. And, and this is how much God loves you. I mean, I can't stress this enough that the reason why it hurts God is because God is a, a God of love, right? And it, for the parents in this room, how many of you guys ever had like, your kids maybe lie to you or do something that they're not supposed to do and, and you've had to kind of go through those emotions? It's not a fun emotion to go through, is it, right? It, it, it hurts, it's painful, it's, it's all those things. And that's exactly how I, I see God. And the reason why it hurts is because he loves us so much. Psalm 139, 17 and 18 says this. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Okay? This is a great passage, man. God thinks about you more often than there is grains of sand on the earth. And a couple years ago at Acquire the Fire, they gave us this number. It was like a four. No, it was a 14 with 19 zeros behind it. That's how many estimated grains of sand there are on the earth. And now that's how God, it says that God thinks of you more often than that. Okay, so you get this picture, man, that this God loves you. He loves me, and he desires for us to be with him. He, he thinks of us more often than that. So if God loves you that much, of course it would break his heart when we sin. Okay, that's why Jesus had to come. Because God desires for us to be with him and to walk with him. And that can't happen if we have not had the shed blood of Christ to atone for our sins. So the second thing is obedience is, is you can get rid of obedience through worship. Okay? Um, worship, love, adoration, and reverence for God. That's how, you do, that's how we defeat the sin virus in the world today. So we worship God with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind. We love him above, above all else. We adore him. And the thing that I think we've kind of started to lose in America is the reverence for God. You know, we kind of think of God as, he's always there and he loves me and it's all good. And, and we forget that God is, is God sometimes. Just like Noah was a righteous man, Noah, Noah, how did he become righteous? He worshiped the Lord. He did as the Lord had asked him to out of love and reverence. Um, what happens if we all started taking the word of God at face value? Okay? Because this is what it means to be obedient. There's things in the Bible that are, are no-brainers, right? Let's, let's, first, let's look at Isaiah 58.10. And if you, sp if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the need of the oppressed, then your light will rise, will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. Okay? So this is saying, look, if we take care of those who are hungry, if we take care of the oppressed, your light's going to shine no matter how dark the world is. And, and then it goes on to say, I love this, it says, your light will, will then rise in the darkness, and your night will become noonday. The stuff that we're dealing with all of a sudden just dissipates because we have the light of Christ shining out of us as we take care of the, the, the hungry and the oppressed. That means feeding those in needs, not second-guessing if they're a scam artist. This is something 
I struggle with all the time is with Christians saying, well, I just don't give money to people who are begging because they might be scam artists. And I'm like, yeah, but they might also be Jesus. Right? Because Matthew 25, 35 through 40 says this. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, you a stranger, invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I have a hard time when we start, when we start saying, you know, I don't know if I should do this when the Bible says we should do it. Because here's the reality is our personal faith walk, if, if someone's hungry and we feed them and they're scam artists, at that point it's between them and God. We've lived out the obedience of the scripture. The scripture said to do that. Right? And yes, sometimes there are scam artists. Sometimes there are things that, that aren't right in this world. But what should, we, we should always be able to say with a good conscience, I was obedient to God in everything. And that's just one of the things that I've, I've struggled with in my life is, is how do we handle those situations? And the more and more I study, the more and more I say, I just need to start, I need to keep just giving money. I need to keep giving food and, and things like that. And I can tell you guys, in that situation, I've met some of the coolest people in the world. Just three weeks ago, there's a guy who was um, asking for food, and I didn't have any money. So I said, hey, you want to jump my truck? I'll take you to McDonald's. And him and I sat down, and we, we shared a, a meal. And, and this guy's this guy, a Vietnam, Vietnam vet who is just, I listen to his stories, and I'm like, holy cows, I'm sitting in the presence of a hero of our nation. And, and it, it just came from taking care of him. And from there, I was able to get him involved with um, Salvation Army and some of their programs to help him out. And it's just one story, right? God has constantly given us a, an opportunity to be obedient to him. And then the third thing I need to point out tonight as we get ready to close is, disobedience leads to disaster. It, it, I have no other way to explain this, man. And people who like to disagree with me and say, you know, sin and disobedience don't lead to disaster, look back at this story. No one was doing what they're supposed to be doing, and, and the heart of man had become disobedient to God and really didn't care what God thought, so he was going to wipe out everything. You know, so, and, and, and like at Romans it says, for the wages of sin is death. And you start looking at this and go, man, we have it wrong. There is stuff we need to be doing besides just walking in grace. Think about, think about this. If Noah had changed God's plan just a little bit, I was re reading some, uh, an article online. It said that had Noah built the ark at 44 feet high instead of 45, it would have tipped over. <laughs> How about that? It, it wouldn't have been balanced to handle it. Had it been just a little bit shorter, there wouldn't have been enough air mass for it to float. And you start thinking, man, man, how different is the world if Noah would have drowned because he wasn't obedient to God and building the boat? A lot. We're not here, right? There was only the set, eight of them on that boat. So if they didn't survive, we're not here. Or how about this one? If God commanded Noah to, to, to keep these animals alive, and all of a sudden Noah's like, you know, I think a zebra burger sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and eat the zebra. And now sin is disobedient to God, and we know that sin and disobedience leads to disaster. That turns out a whole different way, doesn't it? He was completely, it says that he did everything God had commanded him. Noah not listening to God would have caused him to drown in a flood of disobedience. Right? He, I honestly believe if he's disobedient, he's not righteous, he drowns. But instead, we'll pick up the story next week as we see Noah floating on the sea of obedience. Let's pray as the praise team comes forward. Father, thank you for tonight, God, and thank you for challenging us to be obedient in all things in our lives. Father, for each one of us, that means something different. And, and Lord, right now, I just pray that you speak to our hearts. Lord, show us the areas we need to be more obedient to you. Father, show us, show us the areas where maybe we, we've just not been obedient at all. And you're calling us out tonight. I just, God, I really feel like you're challenging us 
to, to apply the word of God to every decision we make in our lives. So, Father, give us a hunger for your word. Give us a, a passion for your presence. And, Lord, I thank you for this time tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final song.
Father God, thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for meeting us here, Lord, being true to your scripture. You say where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Father, we just love you and we adore you. And Lord, we pray that you will use us to be a light to this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace and serve the